Okay. Hopefully this works. Okay, yeah. So I'm Peter Marting, and uh, I'll talk to you guys about uh, art, science, and my journey through both. So as basic scientists, our job is often exhilarating. We get to go out into the world and discover small truths that are hidden in nature. And we use rigorous techniques to understand how they fit in with everything else around us. And that often has a huge emotional impact for us. It's exciting. It's um, uh, It shows us new parts about the earth and ourselves that we never knew before. And we share this incredible excitement and wonder and awe that we feel through medium, mediums like this, right? These are the outputs of of our emotional and rigorous labor. Stripped of emotion and um, very dry, but incredibly useful and very important, right? We, we have to advance science by removing um, as much of ourselves from the picture as possible. And we might even, if we're brave, go out to meetings and present posters uh, and talk to our colleagues and discuss the results. Um, but in the end, we are humans and we feel these emotions and we have all these, um, these unreleased uh, ideas and emotions about what we do and how we, what we feel about what we do that um, just don't get to come across in any formal outputs as as scientists and so um, that's one of the reasons uh, why I sort of created something like this that we're all a part of today here in this this course uh, the artistic expression of original research and this idea came about from talking about this very thing with colleagues at these very types of meetings you know we you know we on our posters, the words on our posters are, are dry and stripped of emotion. And we present them with uh, such excitement. And we, you know, maybe go out to the bars and have drinks and get really excited about what we do. But none of that makes it into the final pieces that we present. Um, but art is a, an output that is based in emotion um, and is a wonderful outlet for um, all the other things that we as humans, as researchers, as wanderers, as explorers um, can uh, use to express our uh, original research. So my goal with this sort of idea is to tell the narrative of your research, create something beautiful and express your emotions through this process. And these are um, things that don't always, you don't always get to do with the traditional aspects of uh, scholarship in, in the sciences. Um, so, you know, we, we can come together, we can talk about these ideas, we can prototype, we can um, discuss how we feel about these things. Um, we can um, sort of walk in other scientists' shoes and try and understand how they feel about things. Um, so as a tool among scientists even, um, this is a really powerful medium art um, to explain our research um, and potentially has even grander aspects um, once we reach the public uh, because uh, people who aren't scientists um, emotion is a language that everybody understands. And if they see your research and you as a scientist and how you feel about everything, um, the message gets translated and sticks. 
So yeah, th these are just some images from the uh, original course I ran at Arizona State University. Um, and we ran this for uh, two different semesters. So uh, at the end, you know, people come up with all kinds of different things, visual art, music, poetry, sculptures, paintings. Um, so, you know, really it's what you feel comfortable with and what you like to do. It's, it's your expression. So, um, you know, I also participated in this course um, as well as sort of like um, organizing it and, and running along with everybody else. Uh, so I, I'd like to give you a tour of some examples um, that sort of kicked off from this and um, carried out on beyond this course and into uh, what's I'm developing is sort of um, a career of blending art and science. So we'll talk about the patient light lover, Socropia tree songs, the forest of the glowing symbionts, the collective endotherm, and social ar architecture in four dimensions. So during my PhD, I studied this beautiful tree here, the Cecropia tree, found all throughout the neotropics from Mexico to Argentina. If you take a closer look, you can see that it's being patrolled by this ant species, very fierce species of ant called Azteca. Azteca ants protect the tree from herbivores that want to uh, eat its leaves. And in return, the tree provides it with food from these food bodies that it grows specifically for the ants and in the form of shelter. So the stems of the tree are totally hollow and the ants um, inhabit the tree. That is their only home. And this species of ant doesn't even really leave the tree much at all. It is their whole universe. So it's a very intimate symbiosis, uh, symbiotic mutualism. So I'm gonna sort of talk about a few pieces um, that sort of increase in complexity and sort of uh, involvement. Um, the first and sort of most basic is, is just the painting. Um, I call it the patient light lover. And this one is not so much um, embodied with raw data, but more sort of explores a narrative uh, about research that um, somebody who came before me did um, about the Cecropia tree and its uh, initiation of life. So in the very beginning, uh, a Cecropia seed lays dormant in the soil for weeks, months, even years, can be waiting uh, in the dark soil of the rainforest, and it is waiting for light to hit the soil around where that seed lays. And that comes about by a branch in the canopy falling over or a tree falling down, creates all this light in the environment. And that basically uh, changes the bacteria in the soil around the seed and uh, triggers the germination of the seed. And the seed takes off and uh, rockets upwards. This is a pioneer species. So it grows very fast and it's the first to colonize gaps in the forest. And before long, it's a little seedling. Growing in the forest. And soon after that, its stem swells and becomes hollow and starts producing food bodies. And that's when the ants 
inhabit the tree. As you can see here, the stem is being patrolled by all these little Azteca ants. And so this painting that I did, I wanted to sort of uh, show the this process of uh, light being exposed uh, by a, a fallen tree branch through the canopy and um, shining a light on the forest floor and which is a space for this Cecropia tree to grow. And so just in layers here, I sort of uh, just wanted to show you, it's a very simple, very basic, unskilled painting, but um, it is kind of embodied with uh, this emotion that I feel about uh, this process, which is um, almost like um, held in, in really high regard, this this sort of like, uh, it's almost like this godly light breaking through and, and creating life in the understory. Um, so put the back layer, I, I wanted to get several layers of forest here to feel sort of thick um, jungle. Uh, so sort of darkening the colors with every layer. And um, there's the beam of light coming through, breaking through the canopy. And there's the star of the show, the Cecropia tree grows. And then the uh, final layer, sort of uh, the foreground black in, in front of everything, sort of uh, frame everything up. And so I call this one the patient light lover because the seed is laying dormant in the soil until this ray of light hits the soil around it and it germinates. and is ready for the Azteca ants. So this next piece um, I call Cec Cecropia Tree Songs, also from my PhD. Um, and this one actually does take the raw data that I've collected and turn it into uh, a work of art. So one of the things I studied um, during my PhD was um these hollow internodes you see the queen there in the bottom um basically i wanted to know where do the ants live inside these hollow internodes and what the structure of the tree is how many leaves does it have how many internodes does it have um where's the party happening are, are all the ants at the top are they at the bottom and so um, I cut open several trees uh, and counted all the ants where they were, the number of eggs, the number of larvae. Um, and you know, this, this as a, 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 sci a work of science uh, was very important because nobody had ever done this before, quantified the colony distribution of these ants. Um, but again, sort of as a human, as, as somebody who loves and admires this amazing, you know, symbiotic mutualism, um, splitting open, you know, 13 colonies to see where they were, you know, it's, you know, it's a sacrifice and it's emotional and it's a little hard sometimes. And that's something um, that we don't get to talk about a whole lot, um, especially in our papers or, or even, you know, it's not even really discussed that much, um, but we do feel these things, right? And so, um, I kind of wanted to commemorate this um, this emotion uh, a little bit, um, and so this this was my first foray in, uh, into um, transcribing data into art. Uh, but be before we get to that part, I just want to show you some of the visualizations um, that, like the graphs created by these data, just so you can sort of visualize and see what. Um, what these look like. So um, there's a lot going on here, I understand, but in the center column going up, that represents the internodes of the tree itself. Um, the height of each internode represents uh, the actual height of the internode itself. Um, the gray bars that come perpendicular out on the right side are the number of workers inside each internode. And the white bars perpendicular to the left are the number of larva or brood in each cell. The diamond is where the queen was and each black dot in the center of those um, inner nodes are where the entrances were. 
And then the shading of the central columns is how many of these scale insects were inside. And this is another part of uh, the mutualism where the ants tend insects inside the tree to help um, get sugar from them. And so, you know, I did this with several trees and you can see there's all this variation in how these trees are, um, how these colonies are distributed in the trees. Oh yeah, and one last detail, um, the sort of the gray section that spans across both the larva and the brood toward the top of the tree, that represents where the leaves of the tree were present. Um, so uh, in a lot of cases, the, the ants were distributed where the leaves were, but not in all cases. So I decided to uh, use this data to create music um, and take these different aspects of how the colony is distributed throughout the tree and uh, translate that into musical notes. Um, and so basically each aspect I just described is now a, a feature of a musical note that I synthesized using the uh, program language MATLAB, which some of you may have heard, but it's I'm basically using trigonometry, simple um, sine wave functions to create, to synthesize these sounds. And so this is a video that sort of um, shows how it plays. So, so basically the, the song plays from the bottom of the tree all the way through all the internodes to the top of the tree. And I'll just play it for you now. Um, Jess, if you could give me a thumbs up when you hear the music. Oh, hang on a second. Let me, oops, let me go back. All right, so the music's not supposed to start yet. All right, so there's the tree. And um, then I cut the tree down and there's the graphic there. And so the music is now supposed to start. Okay. Okay, we have a baseline triad chord. Um, and the, the first melody you hear is the ants, the number of workers. And the shading in the column uh, is the uh, pitch wavering. And the queen is buzz. So that, that's a single colony and how um, it sounds basically. And uh, each one sounds a little different. And the thing about it is, you know, one way to sort of commemorate these colonies is to publish the data on them. Um, but another way is to sort of have these sort of little um, melodies that you can listen to and it's sort of sweet and it's it's a little bittersweet, you know? And so, yeah, I have all the rest of the colonies uh, you can listen to on my website. I have them up there. Um, if you're interested later, I can show you that. So moving on, um, the next thing I, I did was the forest of the glowing symbionts. And so, one thing that I studied during my PhD is uh, colony level personality. And so um, these are two trees. One are two trees, both I tapped or basically punched with this little robot that's um, out of frame on the bottom. Um, and one of the trees has an extremely aggressive response as you can see by all the ants swarming the stem and the other tree doesn't 
care too much. Um, and I found this phenomenon to be consistent within colonies and very different between colonies. Um, and this was correlated with a, a, a suite of traits um, that sort of uh, create a, a collective personality for, for the colony. And so I wanted to um, make an art piece that tells that story of uh, different personalities between different um, Azteca colonies inhabiting different trees. And so th this is one that I actually did for this course um, and started out with a faithful drawing where, uh, you know, little sketch about what I wanted to do. And so I wanted to make a physical Cecropia tree and I wanted lights to represent the ants and I wanted it to be interactive so you could actually touch the tree and it would light up with the aggression data from the trials that I actually did in the field. Um, and so I wanted to make multiple trees so you could wander around touching the different trees and seeing the different responses for yourself and sort of come to your own conclusion, some trees are more reactive than others. And started very small with a single LED lighting up. You know, I, I had very little experience in this uh, beforehand. You know, I didn't, I never worked with LEDs before. Um, so I, I just kind of dove into it and learned um, as I went, uh, eventually moving up to an LED strip and then um, working on materials, like what materials to use, what looks good, what feels right, what's easy to get a hold of, what diffuses the light well, um, took a lot of time and a lot of trial and error. And it was something Jess and I were talking about just before. Um, uh, don't, you know, play around. Don't, don't get uh, too bogged down in a single medium. Um, if it's not working, try something else, um, have fun, kind of uh, break it, throw it away, start over, you know, be, be abrasive with it until you find something that feels right. And in this case, for me, it was uh, some simple foam. Um, and so I started building these internodes and um, putting together this tree um, with the LEDs on the inside. And before you know it, um, I built this Cecropia tree um, with LEDs on the inside. And um, then I built five of them. As I said, the, the on the side represents the ants, and it's now lighting up the behavior uh, that are naturally walking along the stem from data that I collected. And um, there's a vibration sensor inside uh, such that uh, you can walk up, touch it, you can shape the tree, and it then shows the animation pattern uh, from when I struck the tree with the little robot and all the ants were swarming the stem. So, um, What's interesting about this one is, I, so I put this on my website with that video, and um, this was towards the end of my PhD. Um, I was wrapping up, I was looking for jobs. I you know, was still pretty passionate about um, conveying research through art, but I, I was looking at more sort of traditional um, postdocs. When I got an email, from somebody in Brazil who had just seen this uh, video of my Forest of the Glowing Symbionts. And they were working at a uh, wildlife sanctuary where they were building a brand new giant exhibit about uh, on Cecropia trees and the ants that live inside them. And they said, we wanna do 
something like these trees that you built um, for the public. And I was like, whoa, this is kind of weird. I don't know about this. Um, but ended up actually visiting because I, I was going to be in Brazil anyway for a conference. I visited the site and I kind of fell in love with the idea and the place. And I said, hey, let's actually make this into a job. Like, could I come and work here and help build this exhibit? And they said, yes. So um, I moved to Brazil and worked among other things um, on creating this exhibit, um, which I have a, a little video of here. So here's Parque das Aves is the name of the place, has a lot of birds. It's situated in the beautiful Iguazu Falls region. There's the Iguazu River in the Atlantic Forest in Southern Brazil. And they're building this uh, basically massive uh, natural exhibit to uh, show off these trees, which are very important um, in that ecosystem. You know, like I said, they're these pioneer plants. Uh, they're first to um, colonize forest gaps. And so they're really good for forest recovery. And so here's the, uh, the plans for the, the exhibit. And so I was brought on board um, to sort of help uh, explain and show off the charisma of this system by taking videos um, and cultivating live Cecropia trees and Azteca colonies and building this art exhibit. And so here's some of the footage that I gathered while I was there of these ants. Here's one inside the tree. Okay, so, you know, we wanted to build this big exhibit um, and to, uh, so we so we made sort of a test exhibit, a small exhibit with both the, uh, the videos, the interactive sculptures and the live organisms. Um, and, it, and it went on for five weeks and it was accessible to the public um, to sort of test how they um, learned and um, accepted and, and uh, were impacted by this exhibit. So here's sort of a, a quick walkthrough of, of the exhibit itself. So the first message is um, Cecropia trees live in the Atlantic rainforest. Ants live inside the tree. And then the tree feeds the ants. So these are simple phrases that we put with each of these videos to sort of get people familiar with this mutualism. And then finally, the ants protect the tree. So it's a little montage of them attacking the herbivores. And then as you round this little corner past the videos, you enter the interactive sculptures. And so um, I was able to upgrade these trees, make them of much stronger quality, much uh, better uh, programming with the lights, more reliable. Um, and so this is like uh, the glowing symbiont forest 2.0 um, because we had, we had a, Pretty nice budget to make these trees much more detailed leaves um, and then finally leaving the interactive sculptures and passing through the live organisms which are in potted trees um, and these are all very small they're very young because I, I hadn't been there too long at this point um, and then finally out uh, exiting the the exhibit and so uh, I was there in Brazil doing this for a year and a half. Um, and that's when the pandemic hit. And so we informed with this um, test exhibit design, we, we designed the full exhibit, which had nine of these Cecropia, interactive Cecropia trees in this big sort of domed room that we were gonna build. And sort of, I had built almost everything for for the exhibit except the building itself which was going to contain them um, when the pandemic hit and so 
obviously the priorities uh, changed drastically um, and I had to leave Brazil and that project got sort of put on hiatus for, for the time being. Um, and I started, uh, you know, exploring other jobs and options and, and, you know, moving forward. Someday I think I'll return and, and complete this exhibit in its um, uh, final form, but uh, I'm not sure when. But, you know, that's just sort of the path that, that we take sometimes. It's, it's very meandering and never very straightforward. So back in the States, as I'm applying to jobs and postdocs and, and some, some more traditional um, academic jobs, I also started to, to apply for artist residencies. Um, oops. Oh, yeah. So this, this is like the, the, um, the test exhibit room. Um, and I, I landed one of these uh, um, artist in residencies at Bloedel Reserve in uh, Washington State uh, on Bainbridge Island near Seattle. And I was there for three weeks. And um, I studied the local ants there and with the goal to do a small research project to um, do this formula that I had just shown you with uh, the macro footage, the interactive sculptures, and the live organisms. Um, so here in this uh, region, there are these beautiful ants called thatching ants that collect uh, branches and pine needles from around the undergrowth and make these massive thatched nests from them. I mean, look at these things. They're miraculous, giant, impressive structures. And so one, one hypothesis of why they build these nests is to retain heat, to raise their larvae, because larvae grow faster when in higher heat. And so we tested this by putting a thermometer inside the nest and one outside the nest on five different nests and monitored them over a 24 hour period. And uh, we expected some different, we expected the nest to be warmer than the outside temperature, but we did not expect it to be this much warmer. So this is in degrees Celsius, um, each line represents uh, all each colony. Uh, the outside is in blue. You can see the sort of like normal a uh, hump of a day's temperature, ambient temperature, but in red is inside the nest. And look how constant that is. That, that really surprised us by how incredibly well that nest does at keeping the heat. And so we did a, a couple other follow-up experiments, but I'm just gonna show you the project that we did based on this data here uh, over this 24 hour period. So I wanted to pay homage to this sort of beautiful, weird uh, structure here uh, and actually build something that looks sort of looks like it. So this was sort of a life-size uh, anthill mound that we built, again, with the LEDs. I'm, I've sort of found my medium, I think, with the LEDs. I, I really like this. So uh, we used pretty cheap, pretty simple materials um to build sort of create this mound cover it with these strips of foam that we cut uh and finally have our our ant mound here and what we did with the data is the colors so the colors um in the inside of the nest represent the, so basically we have a single color map uh, which ranges from blue to red, that represents the degrees in in Celsius. And this arc that you can see around the top represents the ambient temperature. And there's a sun, which is a uh, part of the LED strip that lights up and shows the time of day 
and the color of that sun represents the temperature of the air outside. And as it turns to night, all of the LEDs sort of light up and show the amb ambient temperature. But the lights inside the nest show the nest's temperature. So I used uh, C++ to program uh, Arduino-based microcontroller that controls the LEDs. And uh, oops, this, this is what we ended up with. So the lights that you see um, crawling upwards, those are another part of the experiment, another part of the data where ants were running on the outside with these larvae. So you can see it's now rising with that arc over the top. And you can see that the ambient temperature sort of rising as it goes from those two more uh, teens, but the color of the nest remains in that those warm hues. And look at that hottest part of the day, the nest actually does heat up quite a bit, but then it cools back down pretty quickly, which is also interesting in the follow-up experiment we might have. As the sun sets, uh, you can see the ambient temperature now uh, getting cooler and cooler. Meanwhile, the inside of the nest remains those warm views. So this piece we call the uh, the collective endotherm. And um, you may see, you know, it, it it has kind of a strange look to it. You know, it almost looks like it's covered in hair, like it almost looks mammalian. And, you know, that's by no accident. That's sort of a nod to uh, their ability to thermoregulate sort of these, these um, each individual ant is an ectotherm. It's cold blooded. But the nest and the colony as a whole, as a collective, is an endotherm, which is uh, really bewildering and sort of amazing. So that's sort of uh, thinking of this unit as sort of a mammal at the collective level is, is what we were kind of going for. And, and we had a public exhibit with ants on display and some cool macro footage. Um, and this piece was interactive in that it has a little knob which you can select uh, which time of day you want to inspect, and you can kind of freeze it on any part of the 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 twenty four hour cycle. Uh, and then this brings us to um, my most recent piece, which uh, I call social social architecture in four dimensions. And this is from my work here, where I am now currently at Auburn University, studying honeybees. At, and, and this position I have now is a like a traditional postdoc academic uh, position, which is uh, research based. But my uh, postdoc advisor, he knew sort of this history of me expressing my research through art. And I think that that may have contributed to his decision to bring me on, or at least he was very open and, and uh, supportive of me sort of following this direction. Um, so in this piece, uh, we're studying the nest architecture of honeybees and as it develops in three dimensions through time. So here's a photo of the honeybee nest. You can see these uh, beautiful parallel cone structures that give it the three-dimensional shape. But surprisingly, nobody's studied how that shape takes form through time in three dimensions. So how we did that is every week we would go to the yard, we'd pull the frames off out one by one, brush the bees off, and take a photo in this photo rig of each comb one by one. And then we'd get these beautiful high quality images 
that we then sort of simplify into these masks that are uh, just the simple two-dimensional shape. But we can stack these uh, two-dimensional shapes uh, through time. So, and, and each one of these uh, cones through time uh, makes up the three-dimensional structure of the nest. But because we have the three-dimensional structure through time, that gives it the fourth dimension. So this, what I'm showing you here is a single comb over six weeks of growth. Each shade is uh, the next week in, in the series. And we can animate this using interpolation techniques and show um, sort of the growth trajectory of that single comb as it takes shape in the nest over time. And we could just see that one more time. And you can see it sort of maintains a, a equal aspect ratio in the beginning before spilling out into this lateral bias, which sort of conforms to the uh, shape of the frame that's holding that piece of comb. And like I said, this is just a single comb in a nest that has up to 10 of these combs growing at once. And so I wanted to show this three dimensional shape through time, giving it four dimensions um, using LEDs again, of course. So these images uh, that I showed you with the interpolation, I laser etched those into acrylic and mounted them on a piece of wood. And that gives me this lamp structure here that shows the the honeybee growth in their cones through time. Here's a few images here. And you know, as it turns out, I have it right here with me. Um, this whole time it's been it's been right here. So I don't know if you guys can see this, uh, but this is, let me try. No, that makes it worse. Maybe that's a little bit, it's kind of hard to see, but you can basically select which comb you want to look at. And you can also turn it to uh, into an animation. I mean, it animates the nest growth through time. And it's also, you know, pivots on this so you can inspect any, any comb. Oh, and, you know, while we're at it, I also have, um, you know, the, the forest of the glowing symbionts. Um, I made a, a small sort of desktop version of this. Let's see. Can you see this? Let's see. There. There we go. So this is um, my little tabletop version of the uh, glowing symbiont. And again, it is touch sensitive. So, you know, I can touch this and it lights up with the pattern of the ants that are from the field from, that I that I took. So, you know, we couldn't have the full exhibit in Brazil, but at least I have this little memento on my desk here, you know, illuminating my work, you know, as I, as I work here. So, um, I'd like to conclude with just a few words about the power of art. So branching from us as scientists and close to what we do outward into the ether, we can see new patterns hidden in the data. And I, I have stories about this actually through uh, a lot of these art pieces. I've noticed something that I hadn't by just simply graphing the data. 
It's an impactful way to disseminate this research to a broader audience. The engaging aesthetic narrative of our research creates a longer lasting emotional connection. And ultimately cultivates a more enchanted science literate society that value, values basic research, evidence based policy, and conservation. So, with that, I'll take any questions and thank you so much for um, listening to me talk about all these weird things. And of course, you can find me at uh, aztecasacropia.com. And oh, my email is not here, but I'm happy to um, send you my email and answer any questions or if you have anything at all. So yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Peter. That was awesome. Especially that part I was just thinking about today when you were talking about the sacrificing of the trees and like, I was, I was just mentoring an undergrad who was like having to sacrifice some bee larva. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't know what to tell her. Like, you know, it's so sad and yeah. we never talk about it. <laughs> right. We don't talk about it. <laughs> the art. Yeah. Art. Yeah. Art is a good way to, it's a good place for it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions? You can raise your hands or use the chat. Okay. Yeah. Jen, do you want to go ahead? Hi. Um, thank you for that talk. That was uh, really cool. Uh, you're I love, like they remind me of lamps, like these beautiful decorative lamps. Um, and they're just really gorgeous. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, one's a science question and the other is an art question. Perfect. Um, the science question is, did you notice any change in the shapes of those beehives over time as the bee populations were changing? Like, so, um... Basically, what we found was they maintain this sort of spheroid shape that expands equally in all directions um, until it hits a border with their cavity. So honeybees naturally nest in cavities like trees or, you know, little caves or crevices, wherever they can find. And one, one of the interesting aspects of their transition from their ancestors were um, nested out in the open, more like these giant honeybees from Southeast Asia. And they had single combs um, that were giant single combs. Uh, but moving into a confined space, they split that giant single comb into multiple parallel combs. And they have sort of developed uh, a vocabulary, an architectural vocabulary to be able to expand into their cavity and sort of conform slowly to the shape of that cavity as they reach each of the borders. So we didn't so much see the population of honeybees in the nest influence the shape, but more so the shape of the cavity being conformed to over time. Cool, um, thank you. Um, the second question was, have you uh, thought about like combining your music that you've done with the data and the lights um, and like turning into like one installation that like is showing the data both visually and musically at the same time. Oh man, I have, I've thought about it, but I haven't been brave enough to pull it off yet. I would love to try that though. I think that, yeah, the full sensory experience, um, I think you're right, could be even, you know, sort of take it to the next level. Um, I could, because even, um, the videos that I make of the, these other pieces, uh, I think the choice of music is really important in, you know, showing off these pieces. Um, so if that music itself was also drawn from the data, I think could be, yeah, I think you might be onto something there. Cool. Well, I look forward to seeing it. If you do, um, give it a try. Cool. Yeah, so I think I will. I'll try it. Any other questions? Good question. No, okay. I'll give it a couple more minutes. 
Yeah. And, and like I said, feel free to email me or, or whatever, if you have any questions about, I didn't get too much into the nuts and bolts about how I made some of this stuff, like the programming aspect that that's been pretty important um, tool to translate the raw data into um, something else uh, is I've just used some simple programming, really um, nothing too fancy. It's good to know for me as a less technically illiterate person. Um, Adriana has a question. Yeah. This is all super cool. Thanks so much. I'm really, uh, really excited to hear about this. Um, I just wonder if you feel like there's a difference. Um, I think that I thought it was really interesting that this was actually visualizing data rather than visualizing an interpretation of, mm. uh, of, of the data. And like, do you think there is like, like, do you think there's like ways like, do you, do you think about those two things differently? And how do you um, separate, like, your interpretation from your observations when you're thinking about this in, like, a more, in, like, the more emotional, like, you know? <laughs> you yeah. Know. No, th um, this is a great question. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, balancing the raw data versus having the interpretation present in the piece. And I, I would say um, I am thinking about the interpretation as well. Like when I typically, like how my process has been is I, I like to record the data, analyze it completely and, and have a, a, like a narrative of that data and how, like, what do we learn from this experiment basically before I even start the piece? Um, because I, I, and just for me personally, and people can take this whatever the way they want, obviously, but for me personally, I, I like having the narrative in the piece, uh, sort of the take home message. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, slap you in the face. Here's exactly what I think this means. But I think maybe a more interesting way to do it and more challenging would be to show them the data in a way that sort of guides them to their own conclusion about it, you know, which is a sort of an interpretation that you were thinking. Like, for example, that these trees, um, each tree having a different light um, pattern with its different personality. Um, that's not, you know, it's not like there's a label on each tree saying like aggressive and then this one's docile and then this one's in the middle you know th that sort of final interpretation is, is up to the viewer ultimately um you know something I, i'm happy to discuss unlike i think a lot of artists in, in you know traditional you know art scene you know the artists don't typically talk about the interpretations of their work it's just they leave that completely up to the viewer right or the audience but um in in my case in this case i think uh that that task can be sort of hand in hand with the piece like the interpretation itself um doesn't doesn't need to it'd be i mean it'd be amazing if it's standard on its own and sort of guide people to um interpretations that are reasonable but i think there's no shame in in interpreting it for them sometimes they're not quite there cool thanks yeah thanks for the question mari go ahead hi um Rit, thank you also for a really fascinating presentation um i actually studied formica ants for my phd as well Right. Um, and I've often heard that they move their brood up and down inside of the nest to um, kind of keep them at a steady temperature while they're developing. Um, so I was wondering if um, you like measured the temperature at different different depths of the nest and noticed differences, 
or if it was constant throughout the whole nest or if you just don't know. Um, and then I have another more art related question as well. Sure. Yeah. Great. Great. First question that. Um, yeah. I mean, th this I feel like this little three week project opened up like a whole world of questions. Um, and I thought about this exact question about um, what the temperature is at different depths, but we just weren't able to to get that far. Um, I think one benefit that this nest archetype has for these ants is it alleviates the need for them to move their brood so much because may maybe they'll move them at, at different stages as they grow because each, I think, my, my hypothesis would be the temperatures are stable at different depths. Mm -hmm. um, whereas other ants like uh, fire ants, their nest temperature ch sort of changes throughout the day. As the day warms up, they move all their brood up to the top to heat them up, you know, and then, and then as it gets really hot, then they move them sort of down. And so there's a lot of movement. And obviously that takes a lot of energy to move everybody. But I think um, these particular formica ants maybe have, have solved that a little bit by letting the nest do most of the thermal regulation for them. Yeah, that's really fascinating because that <clears throat> so there are subterranean formica as well as the thatch um, mound building ones, but the subterraneans tend to be a lot smaller. Um, mm. And I've always wondered if the size has something to do with restrictions based on like the tunnel sizes that they can build underground. But mm. now I'm wondering if maybe they've just kind of been able to grow more rapidly or make more use of that energy um, to grow larger brood um, because they have this temperature regulation thing. So that's really cool. That's um, cool. I haven't thought about that. That's an interesting yeah. idea. Very yeah. cool. <laughs> um, and so my more art related question was um, how you landed on the medium of LED lights. Um, was there a lot of experimentation? Because I, I know you went from, I guess, painting to music to light, but was there like some tie in with the research subject that ultimately led to using LED lights? Or was it just like a medium that you played around with and decided you really liked? Yeah, uh, that's another great question. So, you know, to be honest, where this idea came from is, um, you know, this this sort of like broad top level uh, goal I set for this project was I wanted to embody this emotion of, of sort of awe and like um, wonder and sort of beauty and what kind of popped in my mind like as I'm trying to like just brainstorm like media that can you know get that is like a light bulb went and I was like oh that's like so cliche but it, that's it <laughs> like it's the light like the the light the glow like I wanted that glow something something about a glow from an object is kind of magical and I wanted to that's what I sort of gravitated towards. And so it actually came from a higher level um, processing where I was like just thinking of ideas. Um, and that led me down the, you know, I had a little experience with programming uh, microcontrollers for the robot that I used to punch the tree in the experiment. Um, but, you know, with how well, things are documented online just by Googling, you know, I'm able to create these simple programs that translate the data um, using the lights. So that's how I got there. Very cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Lights are also so good for like movement, you know, for capturing. Yes. Movement. Yeah. Cool. Movement that, and you know, even the shadows, like, um, the shadows can play into it. You can play with diffusion, like have harsh light or very soft light. You can have dimming, you know, there's all sort like, yeah, there's a lot you can play around with, with lighting. Yeah. I'm feeling more motivated now to use lighting. It seems mm. 
I recommend um, it. And I think I think a lot of people are feeling super inspired. <laughs> if you look, check out the chat before you log off. <laughs> Lots of great uh, compliments on on your work and. Oh, and thanks. Over a little bit, I guess. There's no other pressing questions. Uh, does anyone have any last questions before? Is Paul Peters here? Otherwise, you can you can email him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, happy to take any questions. Okay, so I guess we'll be done for today. Um, next week will be Barrett Klein talking about uh, digital illustration. Um, well, illustration and how to digitize it. So kind of both of those uh, at this time, at this link. And if you're not busy tonight, you can hang out at Back to the Grind in an hour. We'll have a science night on science policy and science communication. So um, yeah, check that out if you're free. And thank you so much again, Peter. Always a pleasure hearing from you. So inspiring. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to see everybody here interested in this kind of thing. It's really inspiring me to uh, just to see this sort of interest and engagement. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for organizing, Jess. And thanks, everybody, for just being here and being awesome. Good luck with everything. And uh, uh, I hope you make something beautiful. <laughs> thank you.